one regards these giant Douglas firs of British Columbia's forest lands, firs that stood command like lofty sentinels over a then unknown Canada when the cedars of Lebanon were being marshaled for the building of King Solomon's temple. Bewilderment suffuses the beholder at the individual immensity of these leafy spires and the vastness of their numbers. For thousands of years, they have held dominion over the kingdom of the forest, but today, hundreds of feet below their majestic heads, mere man proceeds methodically about the business of furnishing the world with one of the basic commodities of civilization. The woods re-echo with the sound of axes as the undercut is made, which fells the tree in the desired direction. And as the befoliaged monarchs crash groundward, lumberjacks at all points of the compass are busily engaged. When the undercut is completed, the direction of falling is sighted along the axe handle. From the side opposite the undercut, the sawing begins. And after this has been accomplished, a wedge is inserted in the breech and lustily hammered into position. And this great creature of nature comes hurtling towards the forest's floor. Every phase of lumbering requires a high degree of skill, not the least of which must be possessed by what are called the high climbers, the men who climb aloft to prepare spar trees. It is an adroit job bringing these regal firs to earth, but the work has only begun. How to get them out is the next problem, and this is the way it is solved. The high climber ascends the tree by means of a steel belt and a set of climbing spurs. The top has to be lopped off and the branches cleared. Hundreds of feet above, he hacks away. Snap! Off she goes. It's no parlor game, this. But to the hardy lumberman, it's just another topping experience. Once, stripped of its tufted top, Lock and tackle are lashed to the trunk. The lines are run through, and all is in ready for the snaking part of the work, which is the lumbering parlance for the hauling of the logs to the point of transportation. Thus, there often is a team of these aerial cranes to be seen doing their bit. Meanwhile, buckers have been busy cutting the massive timber into convenient lengths preparatory for the hauling. When they dubbed it snaking, they selected a pretty apt term. The logs are no respecter of neighbors in making their forced way over piles of brother firs, very much as a boa constrictor bounding through the jungle. Add to the sharp bark of the woodsman's axe and the crashing of trees and logs, the puffing and grunting of these valiant donkey engines. Given a convenient stream, the logs are snaked to a skidway which shoots them into the water, bound for the mill. It is an exciting experience to watch these gigantic logs being drawn swiftly through the forest, and to imagine that they are but sections of those great firs which sometimes dart up into the heavens as high as a ten-story skyscraper. They are a grand sight, waving in the cool Pacific breeze like a huge Egyptian fan. Frequently, it is a severe strain to look up at them. Failing this, they are delivered to specially constructed lumbering railways. Observe the size of these men as compared to the gigantic load on which they are standing. The business of loading the long cars is a laborious one, even though it is considerably facilitated by crude forest derricks such as this one. And by the time the loading is completed, you can be fairly safe in wagering that here are the makings of a couple of houses and enough rolling pins to make hundreds of husbands' lives very miserable. If the locomotive looks antique, there is a reason. It is built for power, not for speed. It is a far cry from the unsanitary conditions of years ago to the present-day modern system of milling. With a splash and a clatter, the hot specimens are tossed into the large mill pond, which sometimes cover several acres. Here they are kept until ready for manufacture. These ponds facilitate sorting and cleaning and also prevent deterioration, which uh, wouldn't be good for wood, would it? They enter the mill over an inclined chute transported by an endless conveyor known as a jack ladder. As they ascend, they are sprayed 
to remove grit that might otherwise spoil the saws. From the log slip, the jack ladder carries its freight under an extensive series of large circular saws. These are called deck saws and are used if the logs are to be shortened, buzzing through the huge diameter as nonchalantly as a razor blade slicing hot butter. Then other spike conveyors move the results up and down for further operations, executed by the magic touch of 20th century mechanical devices. That is the impressive feature of these great Canadian mills, the absolute modernity of their facilities. Even steam is more or less regarded as out of date, replaced as it is by complete electrical installation. Labor-saving devices may be espied in every nook and cranny. A fine example is to be seen in the buzzing sharpeners, constantly engaged in keeping the mill's teeth clean and keen. Every variety of board and timber is turned out in the course of a working day, and a glance at the diverse machines readily explains the ability of the workers to keep the supply equal, if not ahead of the daily demand from all corners of the earth. Deck saws cut into shorter lengths and band saws strip away the bark and square off the logs into what are called flitches, a hunk of wood to you or me. And a nigger or mechanical arm turns them over. And yet another contraption called a gang saw. Buzzing at a terrific speed in its vertical position, it slices and trims its log into finished timber. The log goes in gaily and comes out four. After they have been planed, the boards are taken into the sorting room, where they are piled in their respective lengths. The modern methods of lumber manufacture are so intricate and so efficient that the term sawmill has given way to that of lumber manufacturing plants. Many new inventions and more efficient methods have brought this great Canadian industry to the front with astonishing rapidity. Once it used to be regarded as a hardship to be employed in a sawmill, but conditions have changed radically since then. All these up-to-the-minute developments which have earned for the land of the Maple Leaf an enviable position in the world of trade and commerce tend to recall those early Canadian times when the vast forest resources were first being tapped to supply material for the crude houses of the hardy pioneers and the stockade for refuge against warring Indians. And strange to say, the supply is still bountiful, though these mills have been converting the mighty trees into timber for the world at large, year in and year out. All lengths, widths, and thicknesses are assembled on the dock, ready to be lowered into waiting ships. There is, however, lots of waste resulting from various steps of manufacture, but this is utilized to the fullest possible extent, sometimes for pulp and paper, sometimes for shorter lengths, and the rest for fuel, all byproducts of a great organization. In striking contrast to the crudely fashioned derrick of the forest, this massive crane fairly lives on well-seasoned board feet, and so across the oceans of the world sail the symbols of a great and thrilling industry of Canada's fair Pacific coast.